Hi everyone and welcome to the Imagining a New We video blog with me, Dr. Samantha Cotrera, a video series designed to help history teachers and other history educators teach history in ways that are more meaningful, transformative, and inclusive for their students. Um, I just want to thank you as always for all of the views, the comments, the direct messages, the emails about the Pandemic Pedagogy series. I really, really appreciate all the support and I hear you and see you when you say like, I just watched this one video and like, I can't wait to dive in and watch all of them. I just don't have time yet. And like, um, I started watching these. I have like a short list of ones I want to watch, but like I'm just too in it right now to really like think through it. And I totally get that. So that's one of the reasons why I'm going to like dial back pandemic pedagogy a little bit moving into June and July um, so that you can catch up on videos and that I can start a new project <laughs> that uh, a new video series that kind of came from a lot of the behind the scenes conversations uh, with the people that I've talked to from pandemic pedagogy so the conversation will continue but maybe in a different vein with that being said if you want to still get in touch and talk about pandemic pedagogy in the summer feel free. I'm still going to do the pandemic pedagogy conversations because I know there's some people I asked in like April that said like maybe come back to me in the summer. So I'll still be doing some of them. Um, I'm just not going to be so active in looking out for people because I'll be looking out for people for a different video series. TBD. So anyway, uh, well no, it's, it is determined. It just hasn't been announced. TBA. There you go. Um, one of the awesome things about this series is to be able to like know all of the different communities and all the different connections that people are bringing to our conversations and that often invite me to be a part of. And like this is an example of that because one of the early videos I talked with John Bickford or Jay Bickford and he works at Eastern Illinois University. He connected me with a professor who's just coming off sabbatical by the name of Dr. Bonnie Lachlan Schultz, who we are going to talk to today, as someone that would be wonderful for this series. Because Bonnie is a historian, but she's also the coordinator of the social studies teaching program at Eastern Illinois University. So if teachers want to teach social studies, they go through the program that Bonnie is the coordinator of. Why can she do both things? Because she was a social studies teacher before she became a historian. And, uh, and so someone that like thinks with both of these hats on. I mean, it's really like Harriet's magic hats in here, which is really a reference that only um, kids that grew up in the 80s in Ontario will get. But, you know, be that as it may. <laughs> um, everyone wears these really interesting hats and Bonnie comes to this conversation with those two hats on. Like I said, she was on sabbatical last year, and one of the things that she was doing on sabbatical was working with uh, middle, intermediate, and high school teachers on civics education. So again, civics education, social studies, a historian, and because she's working on a new book, I know she's really thinking about primary sources. So. All of this to say, I am so excited to be able to talk with her, and I'm so excited that she was able to make um, time to talk with me on this tail end of her sabbatical. So let's go over to Zoom and talk with Bonnie. Bonnie, uh, thank you so much for agreeing to speak for the Pandemic Pedagogy series. I know that coming off your sabbatical, your probably kind of overwhelmed with this type of work again and so I just really appreciate you uh, speaking with me today. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Do you want to uh, introduce yourself? So I am Bonnie Laughlin Schultz. Um, I'm a history professor at Eastern Illinois University in Charleston, Illinois, a small town downstate in, in rural Illinois. Um, I wear two hats in the history department. I'm sort of a normal history professor. And then I also run our social studies education program. So I work on helping students who want to be high school social studies teachers, whether history or civics or some combo of, of that. You And you were a high school history social studies teacher before. So it was like, if I remember correctly, you said that you did like you were a teacher in high school, then you became a historian, and you're also the coordinator of the program. Exactly. 
Yes, and it seems like I planned this all out, but I did not. Um, so I taught high school for a number of years, and then I got a PhD in history, and then I realized there were actually jobs for people like me who had teaching experience, but who were also historians. And and I think that's actually been a cool thing and different than when I trained to be a teacher, where you sort of did education and you did history, and those two worlds didn't didn't talk. So I'm sort of the meeting ground for my students of those two, two schools that they're in. And I think that meeting ground is so exciting and it is hard often for that, for, for people to come to that meeting ground, but also to like hear each other, because what I find is like academic historians don't necessarily know how to say things in ways that teachers can hear that they can bring into their classrooms. And teachers don't really know how to tell academic historians enough. They're like, that, that doesn't help me. I need something else. And so I think it's really powerful that you can bring, that, that you your career brings both together. But I think that translation is such an integral part of history teaching conversations. No, I think it's really interesting, particularly because what we all do is teach and students do not undergo some dramatic metamorphosis from finishing high school to beginning college, right? That the best work that I've done on my own teaching is because I teach a class to my students about how to teach high school social studies. And that has made me, I think, so much of a better college teacher. So it's not different worlds. We just, like you said, I think exactly, we speak different languages sometimes, even though it doesn't really make sense that we do so. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I, I think it does make a little sense because like, you, you are trained, you train in a different tradition. It's the same kind of too with um, uh, like elementary school and secondary school teachers. Like it's interesting because, um, and anyone that's seen any of the pandemic pedagogy conversations know that we haven't even gotten into the questions yet. <laughs> but it's interesting because I was talking with some people on Twitter that do higher education. So like teach history at universities and they were talking about, oh, how can we curate a better class for fall? And I spoke to a grade two teacher who had this like Bitmoji choices board for Asian Heritage Month. And she had said, you know, I've never thought of myself as a curator, but look at me, I'm doing some curation. And it was just like, yeah, this, the more we can figure out how to talk with each other, the stronger and more diverse our practices will be, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so why don't we get started with the first question because it might be a good way to, again, translate or bridge those worlds. So my first question is, have you thought of history any different because of COVID? So this question is really about the present. Like, have you, you thought about history in the present? And um, oh, anyway, so, so have you thought of history any different in the present? Any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think I've been sort of moving back and forth past and present as I think about history right now, in part because I just can't stop thinking about evidence. What is the evidence that we're finding in this moment? So I am a historian of American women's history, particularly 19th century American women's history. And so I think a lot about missing evidence, what we miss about women's experience in the past because we don't have documentation. Um, and so I think I've been, you know, sort of overwhelmed right now with seeing evidence of this moment everywhere. Everything is historical evidence and documents, but it has made me really reflect on how small our body of evidence is for the past. When I'm thinking, you know, my son having a Zoom call with his teacher, that's a historical document of this this moment. No, there wasn't Zoom in the 19th century, but there were these daily experiences for the sort of great events that we talk about in textbooks that we're missing the texture for. And I think that that has, has been really sobering to me, but I would also like to think that it, it has been humbling in that way and will make me more thoughtful as I seek out evidence in the past, I hope. <laughs> well, I love what you said about texture, because I think that is such a key element because I say that it, it has this moment has helped me think about history differently but 
in some ways it's provided evidence to things I already think about history in that we will not have evidence for the emotional experiences and the emotional landscapes in all of these homes related to this. And so how does that, how will that affect how this history becomes written? But then we still are recording a lot. So in other eras where that is not the case, we are both missing the emotional landscapes as well as the evidentiary records. And I think that you're, because I did a video about um, like, why aren't we teaching more women? Because the structure of history doesn't allow it necessarily be, when you're focused on like a very grand tradition of history that how can we make space to think of not only different evidence, but like to allow space for even like creative nonfiction with a little bit of evidence that we have. Have, have these ideas come into play at all for you at all? No, I think that's really interesting. And I think one of the sort of hallmarks of, of, for me as a historian, so I wrote a book about women who were sort of ordinary in the 19th century, but they were related to a really famous guy, John Brown. And there were moments when I was recreating their life and there's lots of evidence because they knew a famous guy. They were part of his yeah. family, so their stuff gets saved. But also that interior, interior experience that you're talking about a little bit, you know, there's not a lot of evidence for for that. And you sort of hit this moment of, do I speculate? Where is, when do I become comfortable saying, I think someone felt something? So we think that there's that going on with some of the emotional landscape here, that it sort of gets against this place where we start to be like, no, I'm a social scientist, not a humanities person. I've thought a lot about this question of sort of, is history art or science? And where we, you know, where do we fall? Are we a social science? Are we a humanities? I think the pandemic has made me double down on we are a humanities because we cannot, we cannot completely understand the past. And part of it is that we want to understand what people thought and experienced and felt. And that becomes difficult to grasp because we tell our students, right? Even if we have a diary from someone and the person is writing, I felt X. We can't trust that source, right? We have to ask about bias and is this person performing for themselves, right? But I think that there are ways to get at people's emotional lives and responses to the loss that is going on. And that we see historians doing that about past events. And so maybe we can look to, to that, particularly the thing that I think about is works about the American Civil War and sort of the shifts in American thought as they grappled with with death changing, right? People dying so far from home without the ability to have what a historian Drew Faust calls the good death that really involved sort of this deathbed moment with your family around you. We're seeing the same thing happen now in hospitals where families are barred from, from witnessing that moment, providing comfort. And I think it's maybe our study of the past here that even can help us ask thoughtful questions about the present and think about how we suss out that that experience and write about it. Mm, that, I mean, when you're saying like, I think about, is it, is, is history, is it social science or humanity? That is, that is really powerful. Aaron Stout, who's another person I interviewed for the series, said that history is a humanity. We really need to, to sit with the emotions and to be able to kind of feel through. But to me, a key element of that that statement that you're making too, is for teachers to understand themselves within that kind of binary. Like, what do they think their purpose is in teaching history? Is it to understand the emotional landscape of a particular moment, or is it just to assess criteria and assess evidence? And I mean, you know, I, my, my <laughs> perspective is that it should be about emotional landscapes and experience, but it, it doesn't need to be. Um, but I think what you're also saying about like this moment in thinking about history as a humanity can help us think through a lot of the, the societal grief that we are gonna be experiencing. Yeah, and I think categorizing history as a humanities too is saying that we can't know everything about the the past. And this makes many historians kind of squirmy, like, no, of course, I am capturing objective truth about the past. We know that is not 
True, and I think communicating that to students, both at the college level as well as secondary and even down to elementary, you know, that becomes very, very hard because students still arrive in my classroom thinking history is what happened in the past. And we have to sort of unpack that. And I think this moment will be a great moment to help students think through, okay, well, what's the textbook paragraph gonna say about this moment? Is that really, does that match your experience? How does this, this work? So I think the feelings are there, but also this classification of our entire discipline. So I wrote a blog post in late, am I still muted? No. So I wrote a blog post in late May for the COVID Chronicles, which is um, a blog that has come up in Canada about the experiences of COVID. And it's about like my camera roll on my phone from the last two months. And oh, I was cool. like, my camera roll is an archive of grief and longing and community, but you can't see that unless I narrate it for you because, because the pictures of me like, like a selfie of me in the woods smiling might seem like, oh, look at this, you know, late thirties woman in an urban setting coping really well. Um, and it makes me think about the evidence that has to be narrated. Like that was an important walk in order to X, Y, or Z. And I think because students are recording so much of their lives right now, um, not just because of COVID, they too can think about those things through their, the, their own record collections. Yeah, no, I think that is is great and really will, you know, the the I don't even want to talk about a silver lining, but a way for students to really understand the nature of of history and evidence. And when we look at photographs from the past, now are we going to think differently about what we we know and also just encouraging people to document this moment and to write stuff down and to explain to us your camera roll so that when someone looks at it a hundred years from now, there are liner notes for it, essentially. Um, a different type of record with a liner note. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, but it also is a good moment for our young people also to think about like, why are essential workers who, uh, in Canada at least, are predominantly racialized people, why don't we have as many records from them well, because they are busy. <laughs> the people that are creating the most amount of records have an element of privilege to be able to do that recording. And like, I think that this moment can help, can help bring up that discussion in a classroom about the evidence that we have in the past and how this moment demonstrates to us how some evidence gets saved and preserved and recorded and some don't. Yeah. No, this makes me really think too about this moment of where for many students, history feels very traditional. We should talk mm -hmm. about politics. We should talk about wars. But then if we want, if we want them to sort of claim ownership of documenting this moment and thinking that their experience matters, that challenges them to then look in the past and say, okay, well, my experience matters. Like groceries from his experience matters. What about people in the past who would fit our niches? You know, so I think that it has the, I mean, I think we as teachers have the power to make this sort of reshape the way students think about history and who counts and how we find voices in the past because we have this living example of, of whose voices are being recorded and, and not right now. Even in this great age of technology where most of us have smartphones and have the ability to, to make a record. I think too that it also can help teachers recognize the diverse lives of their students that they might not have a chance to see in the same way. So for teachers to also think that the records that their students have created during this time are different than the records that they created during this time and to make space for those other lived experiences in how we think through this moment. So rather than just being like, don't forget, you know, <laughs> these other records are there, but like, let's look at your own records to be able to identify how they look different despite the moment being the same. Yeah, absolutely. I think this moment 
you know, is going to forever change sort of teachers' assumptions that every student has the same experience and access to technology, uh, you know, like home, you know, it's very, it's very interesting to sort of see, see what this disruption in education is, is laying bare, I think. Well, this, it seemed like a good moment to switch to the other question about the future. Do you think the ways that we teach history will change in the future from this? Not just about, you know, there might be more integration of technology, but like this, this thinking about evidence, this thinking about or understanding or seeing the different lives of students, do you think that will come into play at all in teaching history? So do you think history will change, teaching history will change after this moment? I think it can. You know, part of the power I think of a series like yours is that it really pushes us to be reflective and to stop just sort of getting through the hard bits of teaching right now and sort of think about not just our own work and discipline, but what we're doing in the classroom and to be more intentional about it, um, particularly, you know, how can I be a good teacher right now, whether that's online or with students who are having such traumatic experiences, many of them, I think will become, can become a pressing question that then becomes a question that drives a lot of our teaching in the future, even when we're not in this, this moment. I mean, I think the impact on the teaching of history and talking about evidence, you know, I'll have my students in the fall continue to collect evidence and document this experience and think outside the box in terms of what what primary sources are and do oral histories and that kind of thing. And I have not been much of a local history person in my career, so that will shift for me. But I think, you know, the bigger charge is, can we just do a better job of being inclusive in our our story of the past because we've had this attention to to um, inequity in this moment can we think better about what our students need that care that you talk about um, as well as obviously historical content skills all of that but that has to be packaged maybe in a new box i hope yeah like Normally I would have a follow-up question to that, but my follow-up question actually makes the most sense as my last question about imagining a new we, because, you know, I argue that we should think of our history classroom with greater circles of inclusion and not just like allowing more people into our circle, but to really challenging our understanding of what that circle could be and what experiences are. And what I'm hearing from your answer is the importance of doing that both with our evidence but also in our practices and our relationships with our students so do you see greater potential after this moment for educators to imagine a new we i hope so um you know i think in the classroom i've thought some about just the power of social studies in in particular, not just history, but also the teaching of civics, especially um, creating students who are news literate and thoughtful about the world who value civic participation. I do open houses sometimes to recruit students to my teacher program. And I made a PowerPoint last year that sort of started tongue in cheek, but that I put change the world, teach social studies. And it was sort of meant to just be kind of funny, right? that you know we get oh, students it's true. <laughs> yeah. but then you know the more i thought about it the more i was like no this is the way we're gonna do this because we get can, you know <laughs> we can model the community that the world that we want to live in particularly when i think about the high school classroom right everybody we can create we can change the world by changing the experience that our students have a kind of civil discourse this kind of thing so we think there is that that potential. You know, I feel in my own country, in the United States right now, this real tension. Um, we had a virtual commencement that Barack Obama did the, the address at a week or two mm -hmm. ago. And he had this I mean, just powerful message, but he kept, he talked several times about leaving behind the old way of doing things. We know they're not working, he said. And I was so struck by that because not everybody thinks the old ways aren't working. And I think some of the fight 
over is the old way working? Is it not working? What is this new America? Do we want to imagine a new world? Um, you know, that, that that is a contest right now. And I wish, I wish I felt confident that it was going to come out on the side of we can't imagine a new, a new world. I don't always feel that way, but I think, you know, in our classrooms, we teach towards hope and we teach towards the change we want to see. Um, and that that is what we have to do. One of the other things he said in those the, the speeches is like, you youth, it is your responsibility to activate and make these changes. And, you know, like I said earlier, like teachers should think about their purpose for teaching history. My purpose for teaching history is for is for transformation for students to feel uh, a sense of transformation about what the world could be and then to activate that to action. And so, yes, yeah, social studies can certainly change the world, but I think that that is our like role and responsibility in our social studies and history classes to give students the tools and knowledge to be able to do that. And sometimes that work can be scary, but but I think it is really essential. And I think we're seeing that more now than ever. Yeah, it's really interesting. In the United States, a number of states have changed their curriculums in response to the National Council for the Social Studies put out a framework for, for social studies that they, everything ends in what they call informed action. And that you're supposed to be teaching students to ask smart questions, to engage in research, to answer them, to have, civil conversations, even of controversial events, and then to end in this, this action. And I really think that is just such a powerful model of even, you know, it's that Barack Obama is talking to the youth, maybe because we've abandoned hope for the adults, right? That you're going to become informed and then you're going to act like that's, that's pretty cool. And to see teachers doing that with their students and to see the empowerment that it gives students to feel like they can be a change maker for lack of of a better word, I think it is, is really cool. And that was happening before this moment. And I see teachers even in, you know, the these hardest of, of times in the spring with remote learning, trying to continue to do this work with their students. And you know, something else about this, about, you know, you're saying with the adults that there are some adults that don't think things should be changed and then there are people that want things to be changed what's interesting is that the people that don't want things to change are often using history as a foundation like let's do this again for example <laughs> or like um the way that things have been doing that have been going have been fine and what's what i think is so important is that people that want to push for a better future often also draw on the past as a way to demonstrate resilience and activism and resistance and in some ways drawing on the past is different than drawing on history because that history has already been crafted and so we can use our classrooms as ways for students to think about that tension too and to think think about the narratives that they want to see and again draw on the past to be able to do this imagining to do this action no, I really like how you're separating sort of the past from history. And, you know, we talked about history as art and science. And here we're talking about it almost as a weapon, right? That it becomes this tool to advocate for change or maybe to imagine a pretend past to stand against change. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I have hoped before all of this that my students would take away from the, the from from my classes is that when someone is pre presenting them in the past we, I want them to stop and listen carefully and then think, is this true? What is this narrative trying to do? That narratives of history or narratives of the past, we use them to do incredible work in the present and we need to be careful. Like they are extremely effective and they are not always accurate. And that is, you know, it's in, the, in some ways it, it is a very, weird time to be be teaching history um i started teaching history in right around the turn of the century and and it didn't feel don't don't date so yourself make sure you identify <laughs> which century because you all are yeah. historian of the 19th century so don't date yourself <laughs> that's true yes 
so around 2000 and it just did not feel so contested you know when you talk mm -hmm. about about things in the past and you know i think that is it is too bad, but it also gives us this interesting challenge and this, you know, sort of clarion call to, we have to do this right in the classroom. There is a sort of moral urgency to giving our students skills to, to figure out, you know, what is, what is the truth out there? What do I believe in? Um, how does the past impact our present? What does it call, what does knowledge of the past call for us to to do in the present? How should we interpret the news? Uh, and I think that, you know, that is the kind of powerful history and social studies that that I hope to see. And maybe that's part of this imagining a new we, right? That if if that the youth we is coming up through that kind of social studies, you know, maybe that is what brings on a, a new world. Well, I think that's a really powerful way to end. <laughs> We've already talked for 30 minutes. This was so wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Bonnie. Oh no, thank you. This was fun. Yeah, and I, I, um, I'm not done with this series or with all of you either. <laughs> like, I think it would be really great to like touch base after and see if and how things are changing once like the, ur the, um, the urgency has kind of lessened a bit. And I think we'll feel that in the summer and it will feel different in the fall. Um, so anyway, let's let's stay in touch. Sounds good. Okay, Thank bye. You. Bye.